We're really lucky to have you here tonight, Greg. Um, and you're going to be sharing your passion for solar power. <laughs> Greg is a solar engineer with Synergy Systems, which is an employer-owned company based in Seattle. He has worked in the field for many years. Um, and many of the projects he's worked on are in Kitsap and Clallam counties. He's also done work with Habitat for Humanity. His home is in Palsbo, and he's been harvesting energy from the sun for many years at your house. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. Um, so he has some slides to share with us tonight, at which cover a, a broad range of information. So thanks so much for coming and sharing your time with us tonight. Um, if people have questions, should we ask them during your talk or at the end? I could. Um, either or. I, I do have a, a place at the end for questions, um, but I'm happy to be interrupted as I go along. Okay, great. All right. Well, go ahead then and we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. I'll um, share a few things about where um, solar is from my point of view. And if you want to uh, allow me to share your screen. I will um, uh, start yes. the slideshow in a minute. Um, I need to make it a cost. Like Marty said, I've been doing solar for quite a few years, probably in excess of 30 years. Um, things have changed dramatically in that period of time. Um, I joined on with uh, Synergy Systems quite a few years ago, and um, it's uh, one of the larger solar energy companies in the area. Having said that, we're only 19 people in the whole company. Um, it's 100% employee owned. Each one of us is a shareholder of the company. Um, I've uh, been doing a lot of work with solar energy since uh, getting my engineering degree. And um, I found that there's a lot of changes. Um, it used to be real expensive and um, used to be, you know, fairly small power output on the solar panels. And they were uh, influenced by uh, a lot of different things, including shade, shadows, and clouds, and trees, and stuff. And um, things are, are much more efficient nowadays from a number of points of view. Um, my function is uh, I'm the guy that goes around and um, makes the measurements and uh, uh, calculates numbers and, and shares those numbers with people. I'm the, the front man, so to speak. So you see the opening slide from my presentation there? Yes. Okay, good. Um, this is something we've put together. Uh, it's kind of a class related sort of thing. It's um, uh, like 28 slides and it'll explain a lot of different things. It's geared towards uh, residential use of solar energy systems with all the current up to date incentives and uh, programs that are available right now as we speak. Um, I also do a little bit of work with commercial and we've done uh, community solar projects in the past. And depending on interest, I can talk about those towards the end as well. Um, but basically um, I, I, I teach a class. Um, I, I've got uh, a bunch of years of experience, a uh, number of certifications, engineering degree. Um, and I've lived in Paulsville for over 20 years now. We have oh, two or three different solar energy projects going on around here, all sorts of different little solar um, things going on. Um, and I've, I've got a lot of experience. Uh, two of my best friends have my solar systems. A couple of my buddies, uh, various different hobbies have uh, joined up and gone solar. Um, and it's it, just a, a real good way to go. <clears throat> um, in our region, uh, we do a lot of work with um, uh, various different organizations. My favorite is the Habitat for Humanity group. Um, and this is uh, a number of the houses that uh, have solar panels on them. And now I think they're up to about 30 houses in that uh, uh, subdivision. And just about every single one of them has solar panels on the roof. Um, here's a training session we did with them a while back. And we've worked with um, a, a number of the different uh, organizers there. And um, uh, we just really like their program. Um, like I said, I've been doing solar for a lot of years. Um, here's me when I first started uh, 100 years ago. Um, the uh, systems are real reliable. They work very well. Um, here's a house over in Monroe. Uh, this one sure just looks like they built that roof for us, but they didn't. Um, 
these solar panels are very, very modular. So it's really easy to orient them uh, nicely on a roof and make everything work out based on the dimensions of, of, of the different panels. Um, I just wanted to talk about a few basic items, uh, then I'll go, go into solar in our area specifically. Um, I will touch on the incentives and uh, give you some cost numbers. Everybody wants to know what do, we, what do I have to spend to get this benefit? Um, so I'll show a couple of examples. Um, and then of course, I'm willing to answer questions and talk more either in a group or individually as people wish. Um, so here's a couple of projects we've done. Here's one of Port Orchard. Um, this is uh, just a, a pretty basic system that is providing power for um, this gentleman's uh, home and his shop and some outbuildings. Um, here's a, a, a larger house on Bainbridge Island with a number of panels and aerial photograph there. Um, we, we have a couple of different terminologies, just like any industry does. Um, the solar module is what everybody calls a solar panel. And that's the basic building block uh, that we use. It's a, a combination of the glass that covers it, the individual cells, the framework. Um, the system itself is made up of the solar modules, as well as the electronics involved and the mounting and all the other stuff that's necessary. The other half of the equation, in addition to the solar module, is called a power inverter. That takes the fluctuating DC power coming out of the solar panel and converts it to very precisely controlled 240 volts AC power. That way we can feed the bus bars in your circuit breaker box in the house. Um, that circuit breaker box is connected uh, to what's called a net meter. Basically the utility comes out and removes the existing revenue meter out of the socket and they put in a very accurate bi-directional net meter, which measures the amount of power going in the house and out of the house. Because at certain times of the day, the house is a net producer of electricity that goes back into the meter and off to the grid. So uh, a number of other terminology words we have. Uh, kilowatt is a measure of the amount of power that is able to produce energy. Um, a kilowatt hour is the amount of that power going past a certain point in one hour of time. Um, the utility measures the amount of energy that they sell you in terms of kilowatt hours. A production meter is a meter that we install on the side of the house. Um, usually it's near the meter that's existing. Sometimes it's inside, sometimes most of the time it's outside. And it's recording the amount of power that the solar energy system produces. Um, not necessarily what you use or you export, but the amount of power that is produced by that solar energy system. We use those to verify the guarantees. These solar panels have 25-year uh, warranties, and we want to make sure that we're getting all the amount of power produced uh, by those systems. We want a record of that. Um, so just a couple of measurements. Um, one kilowatt of solar electric panels produces about 1,100 kilowatt hours per year. That's uh, measured with solar energy data we have for Bremerton. It's actually taken a lot of it from the Bremerton airport where they measure the weather every day. Um, so in order to get one kilowatt worth of energy, uh, two or three solar panels, depending on the size of the panels, are needed to produce that amount of energy. Um, one kilowatt is uh, the minimum required to get the some of the incentives that are out there from the state and federal government. Um, and the average Bremerton home uses about 40 kilowatt hours per day. And that's what it adds up to over the course of a year. So there's different types of solar energy systems. Um, one is a completely grid tied system that's connected to the utility grid through the breaker box in the house. Um, and any excess power is stored in the utility grid and then used at night in the house. That's the simplest sort of solar energy system. You've got solar panels, a power inverter, and the associated hardware. The next type of system is becoming more popular, and that is a grid tied system with a battery backup. And that's used during periods of power outages and storms and things like that. 
the most popular product to use for that is called the Tesla Powerwall. Um, the third option we have is a, a completely off-grid system. In fact, this is what I used to install years ago when I first started doing solar. It was um, cabins out in the woods where people had uh, lead acid golf cart batteries and two or three solar panels as much as a person could afford at the time. Um, those systems we don't really do much anymore. And uh, most of our work, probably 95% of our work is the grid tied market. And that has to do with the incentives that are available in Washington state. <clears throat> so the way this setup works, a grid tied solar energy system, solar panels are sitting up in the sunshine and they collect energy. Uh, that energy goes through this power inverter unit. This is where the uh, fluctuating DC current is converted to 240 volts sine wave AC power. There's some other safety and efficiency items built into that inverter. I can explain those later if anyone's interested. Um, but basically it goes uh, from there uh, through conduit and some other control boxes into the circuit breaker box of the house. At that point, it um, is basically used primarily for loads inside the house, uh, heating, lighting, refrigeration, whatever inside the house. Then if um, there is excess power available, say during the middle of the day, nobody's home, um, that power is exported to the grid. So what's happening is in our state, we have what's called 100% net metering meaning every single kilowatt hour that we produce during the daytime, um, any excess power goes to the utility grid and is accounted for 100% of it in the net meter. That means that at night or in the wintertime, we can use those kilowatt hours that we banked up in the grid. We can use 100% of those before we start buying the expensive grid power. Um, that's an important uh, concept here because in the state of Washington, that 100% net metering program is a lot better than other locations. Um, there's some utilities, say for example, in Texas, uh, where if you backfeed the grid 10 kilowatt hours, you might only be able to get eight kilowatt hours back from the grid at night before you start buying their expensive electricity. Um, there's other ways to do modified net metering around the country, but um, uh, the bottom line is we have a really nice situation here um, because of the way the utility structure works, that 100% meter, net metering, which by the way, um, is able to be transferred to successive owners of the property at this time, say you sell the house, the next owner is benefiting from this grandfathered in net metering program that uh, the current owner signed up for. It's a big advantage when you go to sell a piece of property. So here's just some other installations um, in the area. We, we do a lot of work uh, around Western Washington. Um, my territory, if you wanna call it that, is from um, uh, Gig Harbor up to Port Angeles. Uh, occasionally they'll make me go over and do a project in Seattle if it's complicated or kind of weird. Um, I, I'd rather stay on our side of the water though. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how solar energy works in this area. This is a map of the U.S. with um, colored sections in areas where uh, we've got larger amounts of kilowatt hours per day hitting a flat plate tilted towards the south. Um, you can see that in the southwest, there's all sorts of great energy available for producing power. Um, you know, up in the northern latitudes, there's less energy available. And in the Pacific Northwest, gosh, it's dark here. Well, what does that really mean? Put some numbers to that. Um, Germany, you may know, uh, is a country that has a lot of solar panels. My wife's family is from Germany, and every time we go visit, there's huge amounts of solar panels on all of her family's homes and businesses. Um, but they get the equivalent of three sun hours per day. Um, in Seattle, we're you know almost half again more than that, 4.1. Paul's goes a little bit better than that. Um, Chicago is about 4.4. 4. 
you know, a lot more than what they get in Germany. Germany has a lot more solar panels than we do around here. Um, Las Vegas, you might expect, has lots of solar access available, uh, six and a half hours per day. So that's like twice of what they have in Germany. But there's a lot more solar going on in Germany than anywhere in the U.S. right now. Um, there's another measure that we use. Um, selfish fuck. What's that? Was there a question? Anyway. Um, no. This is a, um, a map that uh, we calculated up. This is a, a very interesting comparison of how solar works in different areas. And what these numbers are is the kilowatt hours per year of energy production for every kilowatt of solar panel installed. It's essentially three solar panels like we learned earlier. Um, and it's not the specific numbers that mean a lot here. It's the differences between these numbers. And these numbers are influenced a lot. The energy production is influenced a lot by the efficiency of the solar panel, the number of sunny days we have, um, the length of the days in Washington, as we all know, we have very, very long summer days. Um, but the big factor is the temperature of the solar panel. Temperature has a very big effect on any semiconductor. That's why your computer has a fan in it. Um, as the temperature goes up, the efficiency goes down. So here's Seattle up here at uh, 1100. Can you compare that to a warm, humid climate in Miami, 1194? Yes, they've got a lot more sunlight, but the temperatures are so much higher that the efficiency drops off. Um, look at Phoenix, area, uh, Phoenix Arizona. Uh, you know, they got twice as much um, sunlight hitting the panels, but if these panels are operating on a sunny day at you know, 90 degrees on that same sunny day in Phoenix, those things are gonna be operating up around 140 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's gonna drop their efficiency dramatically. So even though we install these systems um, to really high quality standards and allow for air circulation, uh, that temperature factor is a big deal. So you see here, the bottom line is that uh, Washington is not that much worse than any of these other locations. Um, you know, not too much different than Florida. Um, so there's a lot of benefits for having solar in uh, the Pacific Northwest. Next one here. This illustrates the um, uh, time influence or the, the months of the year uh, that solar energy is producing the most. This is actually measurements on the solar energy system we installed on the uh, city of Bainbridge Island, uh, City Hall. We installed 254 solar panels on that building. Um, so this is measuring January, February, March. You see up here in June and July, uh, they're getting the most amount of electricity, um, You know, probably five times more in, in June than they get in January. What that's illustrating is that you really wanna make sure that you've got a good site for summertime production of your uh, solar energy. Um, you know, if you have a little bit of shading some trees in the wintertime, yeah, maybe it's not that big a deal. Um, we, we find that we get a huge percentage of our available sunlight uh, during the six months of the year around June and July. This just talks about the, the track of the sun going across the sky. You can see that obviously in the wintertime, the sun is low in the sky. And if there's trees and stuff out in here, they might be affecting our solar panels. 70%, um, a, a a fully 70% of our energy uh, comes from the summertime part of the year, late spring, summer, and early fall. So we wanna make sure that during these months, we've got really good solar access. So here's one of the little secrets we look for is we wanna try to make sure that a good site uh, it doesn't have a lot of shading between the hours of 9 a.m. to 3 or 4 in the afternoon. Um, that's when we get a lot of our energy. So that's why I, I do a lot of site visits. I, I have an instrument that I use. I mount it on a telescoping pole to go up to the top of a two-story roof. And um, I can measure really accurately uh, solar access numbers. And that's how we can calculate the value of the energy that the system produces. 
Um, so when when somebody signs up for getting solar panels, they're not getting some you know mysterious pig in a poke. You know, you, you get real numbers. Uh, customers tell me they're actually receiving more power than what I've calculated sometimes. So I'd rather have it that way than the other way around. Um, here's some examples of things that uh, happen in solar arrays. Um, you see this ground mount system. This is over in Bainbridge Island. Well, late in the afternoon, uh, these trees are shading part of the solar panels. Um, this drops off the power dramatically. So uh, if whoever laid this out would have done a little more careful uh, site measurements, perhaps they would have shoved the array further to the right a little bit. Or I, I'm sure by now the, the homeowners taken down some of these small trees over here. Um, another site you can't do too much about is shading from this big chimney here. Um, you see every single day of the year, it's casting a shadow on some or more of these panels. Uh, and, and that causes power losses. So typically what I will do on systems that I lay out is right behind a chimney, we'll have a big void where there's no solar panels. Um, that's just something we like to do just to, to keep our systems efficient. If I install an efficient system, then I've got a happy customer. If I got a happy customer, then I got more happy customers. We're getting at least 50% of our new business from referrals these days. Um, so what is it that really makes a good solar roof? Um, it's more efficient to lay the panels out in a nice big square, big rectangular areas, very efficient and low cost way to do it. Um, uh, these are just numbers like we looked at before. A uh, typical solar energy system might be six or eight kW. Actually, that's kind of old. Nowadays, people are, there, there's no more uh, maximum limits for solar systems nowadays. It used to be a 10,000 watt system with a big system, but all we saw. Nowadays, um, the limit is really what the local utility will have. Um, and that's all the way up to 25 kW before we start to have to do transformer studies. Um, so we're seeing quite a bit larger systems than we used to. And I think a lot of that is because the cost of solar equipment has gone down and people are tending to use more electricity. Um, the people I saw earlier today, they're spending about 150 bucks in the summertime and about 300 bucks in the wintertime for their monthly utility costs. I mean, with my solar panels here at my house in Paulsville, you know, we're typically 40 bucks, 50 bucks. Now, I don't think I've seen a power bill over $100 um, for a long, long time. Um, let's see, orientation, it's best to be facing south in this uh, hemisphere. If we're southwest or west, that's great. Uh, west is actually better than east because we tend to get, uh, if we're going to have a cloudy day, it'll be um, uh, cloudy in the morning and quite often not in the afternoons. So we get a lot of west light that we don't get in the morning. Um, and we, we, we certainly don't have any problem with a west or an east roof. As long as the roof isn't real, real steep, if it's way too steep, then the ridge of the roof actually shades the panels, um, uh, like a west-facing roof would have uh, shaded panels early in the morning if it's way too steep. We also take a look at uh, things that might be happening in the future. One of those is trees growing in front of the panel. What kind of trees are sitting there? What, um, you know, are they the neighbor's trees and there's no control over them? We really look at what might be happening down the road. And one of those things is the condition of the roof. Um, I don't want to be installing solar panels on a roof that's uh, 25 years old and is going to need to be replaced in two years because uh, then all the solar panels have to come off and be reinstalled after the roof percent. So we really try to make sure that uh, we, we, if we don't install on a roof that's over 10 years old, everybody seems to be happy. If it's 10 years old or over, then we're going to be talking to the homeowner about hey, well, maybe you want to have a roof done while you're waiting for the solar panels to get here. Um, it's just a, a recommendation. <clears throat> we offer a couple of different brands of solar panels. Um, these are actually made in the state of Washington. Uh, this stands for silicon fabrication. There's a couple of plants up in the, the Bellingham area. Um, they're actually owned by the Canadians. Uh, this company is the largest 
manufacture of solar panels in North America between their three plants. Uh, their headquarters is up in Toronto. Um, these are good panels, but they're unfortunately all completely sold out. I won't be able to get another uh, one of the made in Washington panels uh, until probably second quarter of next year. Um, the other brand of panels we offer is a California company called SunPower. They are the high efficiency panels. They're known to be the highest efficiency on the market today. Um, their individual cells uh, called Maxion cells are special in their construction. And, um, they've been around for close to 30 years. A professor at Stanford University came up with a way to make the positive and negative conductor uh, both be on the back side of the cell. So there's no longer any grid lines running on the front of the cell that blocks light from hitting the active portion of the cell. Um, Sun Power has a number of high quality features. We really like them a lot. They have the best warranty in the industry. Um, they say that the, uh, they're guaranteed to lose more, no more than 8% in the 25th year. So they're saying that the panel will still be producing at least 92% of its original nameplate rating in the 25th year of the warranty. People ask me, well, how long do these panels last? Um, the three oldest panels I have at my house were built in the early 70s. I looked at the serial numbers. That makes them 45 years old and they're still cranking away. They were working today. Um, and they're not as efficient as these new panels but I'm not gonna replace them anytime soon because they still do the job. So um, a couple of different things about these panels. Um, the sun power ones are a little higher efficiency, best warranty, um, been around for quite a while. Uh, the silicon fabrication company, uh, Toronto, um, they've got a lot of experience. They've been making them in Bellingham for about eight years now, if I recall. And they make a really good panel. They're uh, optimized for the weather conditions we have. They're still not quite as efficient as sun power, but they're a lower cost per watt. Um, so that's kind of a summary of the, the differences between those two panels. Um, I wanted to talk about the incentives for solar energy systems. There's state and federal incentives for putting solar uh, in your own home. Um, the, the most important one is the solar energy tax credit. Um, right now it's 26% of the entire cost of the installation, including materials, permits, uh, shipping, labor, everything. Um, Hi, it goes, Your picture's looking great too. <laughs> Do you still might see my screen? Oh, hey, how's, how's it going? Good, good. So um, that incentive is scheduled to drop to 22% uh, next year after December 31st. Oh, uh, wow. How awesome. We lose 4% of that. Oh, I'm so uh, happy for spread. you. It Can is. Can you hear me okay? Anyway, um, we're doing installation scheduling into January and February at this point. So all the systems I'm quoting right now are calculated at a 22% tax credit. Um, we have a 100% exemption from Washington state sales tax. I don't have to charge sales tax for any of these systems, including battery storage should the customer decide they want that as well. Um, the uh, net metering, which I've men mentioned before, that's a big portion of the incentives we have. Uh, and of course, um, you know, homes with solar power uh, sell better and faster uh, than if a person wants to sell their home without solar. Uh, there's a number of studies that uh, point to about that. And now with as many electric vehicles as we're getting on the roads, uh, a lot of people are wanting to um, gas up with electricity that they've made at their own residence uh, for their car. You're essentially making your own power. Um, I think that's pretty cool myself. I've had a number of customers that have electric vehicles or want electric vehicles, and they're asking me to size their system a little bit larger uh, to account for that, which is going into their electric vehicle versus the gas tank getting filled up the local gas station. 
Um, that just talks about the uh, incentives for um, different um, what was saying, um, panels at different places. In years past, we used to have a made in Washington incentive um, that run out of funding at the state level. So we're no longer able to offer that at this point. Maybe one day they'll get more funding for it. So I wanted to give an example and show everybody what a typical investment might be for a solar energy system. So yesterday I um, took a, a, a total system diagram and a system calculation for an average size house. Um, what this is, is this mythical single family, uh, three bedroom, single bath home in Bremerton. It's on, it got a one story roof. It's got a six and 12 composition roof facing south uh, with one rectangular ridge section. They do have some trees that uh, account for a little bit of shading and they consume 40 kilowatt hours a month, uh, not per day, I'm sorry. Um, so that's what I size this system for. Um, basically it comes out to uh, 15 panels uh, or 19 panels of the made in Washington variety because they're less power. So the upfront investment was this number, the tax credit was this number, um, the uh, utility savings over that period of time uh, was this number. I had calculated it covered about half the consumption of the house. Um, and so these numbers are what we call estimated profit. It's actually not profit because it's not taxable, but it's money that you got that you wouldn't have had if you didn't have the solar system installed. So you can see that um, over a period of time, these systems do pay for themselves. Uh, we're getting a lot of people that want to get solar just because they want solar. And it's just nice that uh, they do pay for themselves. In fact, solar is one of the few home improvements you can ever buy that do pay for themselves, not just counting when you sell the house, resale value, but over the period of consumption as well. Um, now, so there's some variables that go into these cost numbers as well. Uh, a really steep roof that's really way up there, gonna cost more to install, takes us more time to do it. Um, types of roof shingles, like a metal uh, composition, I'm sorry, a metal standing seam roof is a little bit less expensive than a composition shingle roof. Um, if there's any structural issues we have to deal with, overspan rafters, uh, if we've got to upgrade the electrical service to meet with the solar, uh, all those sorts of things. Uh, an installation that has panels um, all over the place, very stretched <laughs> layout. That's going to cost more to install. Um, it's going to be a little more goofy looking. And notice here we've left a lot of room for that shadow uh, from the chimney here. Uh, we really want to make sure that all these solar panels have the opportunity to produce the most power. We also offer uh, Tesla storage batteries. There's actually two brands of storage we offer. Um, these are, I mean, they work really good. They're, they're not cheap, um, but uh, a lot of people like the idea of being able to produce energy during a power outage and store it on site. Um, if the power doesn't fail very often or if it's not a big deal, then you can certainly save a lot of money by not including the storage batteries. My guess is that we have approximately 5% of our customers including storage battery but about 95% of our customers love to talk about batteries. Um, there's a lot of storage battery news uh, that people see and they want to just get all the answers. So I spend a bit of my time talking about the benefits uh, and drawbacks of installing solar, uh, installing the battery with your solar. Um, bottom line is there's no payback on storage batteries in the state of Washington. Uh, there's zero return on investment. In fact, they actually draw down the output of the solar system slightly by keeping the batteries topped off. Um, so anyway, uh, there's something that can be retrofitted later if a person wants to, uh, or if they're really, really worried about losing power um, and a power outage or blackouts, uh, long or short, we can certainly install it. They make a really good backup because the power transfer from grid to store energy uh, happens very, very quickly. Sometimes you don't even see the TV blank or anything. Um, so this just talks about what a uh, storage battery can do. Uh, the typical installation is one or two of the Tesla power walls. 
um, and that might be 10,000 watts of, of, of production energy capacity uh, or 26 kilowatt hours of energy storage. 26, we talked about 40 kilowatt hours as an average usage. Um, so it's somewhere around a third of the total uh, usage that an average house might have. Now that 40 kilowatt hours average throughout the year, that's summer and winter average together. So in the winter time, it might be 80 kilowatt hours. Well, when do most of our power failures happen? In the dead of winter during the storm. So that might mean that about one sixth of your energy throughout that winter day could be supplied by a single uh, Tesla power wall. So there's certainly some conservation involved, but at least the fridge keeps running and you got lights on and things like that. Um, this talks about how long a power wall might last in an outage. Um, if it's in the winter time, um, the solar system would add about 62% more energy to this time frame. Um, in the summertime, it would basically double it. But we don't have too many power failures in the middle of the summertime. Um, so what's a power wall cost? It adds on to the solar about 16 grand. They're not cheap. They do get the benefit of the tax credit and the sales tax exemption. Um, so the final investment is approximately this number. If a person wants to add a second one or a third one, um, obviously the cost is lower because the, uh, the switch gear and stuff has already been installed. Now, without the solar, it costs a little bit more because there's some other components we have to install. There is no sales, ta or a sales tax exemption and there is no uh, federal tax credit when you install it without the solar. So obviously the cost is going to go up. Um, financing. A lot of people really like this program. It's called the Sustainable Solar Financing Program. And it allows for uh, most of our customers to finance 100% of the entire cost of the solar energy system. This credit union used to be called Puget Sound Energy Credit Union. Well, they split off like the Boeing Credit Union did a few years ago, and now they offer financing for energy projects in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana. Um, and it started just from the company credit union, PSE. Um, they will offer up to $100,000 uh, of, of credit towards a solar energy system. That's a big system. Um, they can also finance part of the uh, roof area. Uh, say we need to replace the south part of the roof uh, for the solar panels. That's all doable. Uh, it's an easy online application, 24-hour uh, approval at the very most. Um, the rates uh, depend on credit score and the term of the loan. They'll go from six years all the way up to 20 years. The best deal seems to be about 15 years. Um, the last one, uh, my customers have signed up for one of these. Uh, they got 3.79. Uh, they're pretty happy with that. The neat thing about these loans is there's no um, uh, there's no second mortgage put on the house. They they're secured by the solar panels themselves. It's kind of cool, I think. Um, so next steps: if anyone is interested in getting solar or finding out what it looks like for their own house. Um, you schedule for a free site assessment. Basically, I can do those either online or in person, depending on uh, the variables. Um, I provide all the numbers for usually two or three different options. Um, provide the paperwork. It's quite often done by DocuSign. If you want to do the, the sustainable solar loan program, I can I help you guide through that. Uh, you get your system installed and go from there. Um, here's my contact information. And um, if there's any questions, if anyone's still awake after my talk, I'm happy to answer questions. Is anybody still there? Yeah, we're still oh. here. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the quiet out there. <laughs> yeah. uh, does anyone have any questions? What kind of a roof load pounds per square foot do you figure for the a solar system of, you know, whatever sure. it is, 12 panels or 15 panels? Um, the panels are spread out. It's a distributed load. Uh, each panel has an average of four point loads onto the roof. 
the distributed load is about 3.7 pounds per square foot, which is approximately equal to another layer of roofing on the roof. Um, your rafters are supposed to be designed by code to handle three layers of roofing. And so if you had solar panels and your roof, that's considered to be essentially the value of two layers of roofing uh, with a 50% uh, structural reserve. Thank you. Can you um, talk a little bit about ground mounted systems, what they sure. kind of implicate for cost and potential efficiencies um, um, and the like, um, obviously generic, but. Sure, I can, I can do that. The, sure. the very last solar array that I put at my place is a ground mount system. Um, they're, they're very good when the roof is not very appropriate. Either the roofing is old, but not due to be replaced or say the roof is um, the wrong angle orientation or has a lot of shading, we commonly run into those situations. Um, a ground mount has the advantage of we can angle the panels to the perfect angle and perfect orientation. Um, we can quite sure, often put, on a, put them in a location where uh, it's not used, you know, stick it on the backyard or out in the field or whatever. Um, the drawback is it does require a structural support to mount the thing. Uh, it's usually supported by two inch galvanized posts sunk in concrete um, with aluminum framework holding the panels. It's not that the panels weigh very much, um, but the wind loading is the big concern. So we wanna make sure that we have the concrete to keep everything stable. And then of course, there's a trench that runs up to wherever the meter is at the house or the breaker box. Um, so those two items do add to the upfront investment of a ground mount system. But um, I'd say we, we do a fair number of them. Um, we, uh, we've got three of them lined up right now to go do. Um, probably, I don't know, 10% of our installations are ground mounts. Um, you, you do have to get a, uh, a permit. We take care of the permitting, of course. Um, but we do have to conform to setbacks. Um, one thing we don't have to conform to is the groundwater infiltration um, percentages um, because there is gaps in between the panels and rainwater runs right through in the ground below. Um, mm. So that impermeability uh, percentage that the county makes you go through when you're putting in a driveway or something, we don't have to deal with that. So as a, as just a quick follow-up, as a structure, it's subject to the setback rules. I mean, we're in Kitsap County, so, and on Bainbridge, Bainbridge Island, which is kind of an alternative universe sometimes. Um, so it, uh, the structure generally would need to conform to some specific setback requirements in the building code? Yeah, the setbacks are usually um, five feet on the side yards and either five feet or 10 feet on the backyard. Uh, back property line. Um, so it's, it's, you know, we take in that into account, but it's not usually uh, a showstopper. Uh, we do pull a permit for them. These uh, frameworks are engineered. Um, they're manufactured by a company down in, um, uh, down by Portland. And um, now, Representative Kilmer, once again, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us. I'm down in Tacoma. I'm active with Citizens Climate Lobby. I also have a radio program, my local radio here, Climate Talk. Uh, where we talk about climate. I've got bunches of grandkids here in Tacoma and they're all precious to me. And I can, appreciate you working Marty, with can you, for uh, us to mute build a livable people? future for them. I, I can't mute them. John, can you mute the host? Excuse me? I, it's not me. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't mute anybody. Yeah. I have a question. Okay. Can you address the, the lithium and rare minerals uh, situation? I know that uh, some of our lithium mines have, have gone to waste because uh, we had the Chinese uh, competition. Um, and I know that there are some lithium mines in Nevada, uh, but the problem is that they take a huge amount of water. 
And, and there's, they also uh, barge into some of the, the native reservations. So what can you tell me about that? What is the impact? And are we getting most of that from China? Well, let me talk about some of that stuff. I, you know what, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. You guys have seen enough of that. Um, okay, um, lithium is a very big part of any storage batteries that are commonly used nowadays. The Tesla Powerwall, uses lithium cells, the vehicles, uh, all electric vehicles use that. There's not much lithium involved in the solar panels, so a grid-connected solar energy system is not effective. Um, but one of the problems we have is sourcing uh, lithium supplies from various different locations. Uh, anytime you're importing uh, minerals from a country that uh, has, uh, what's the word, questionable, um, uh, things going on, uh, we get real concerned as consumers. Um, so uh, yes, uh, lithium is actually one of the most common minerals on the Earth's crust, but it is so active that it gets diffused over lots and lots of cubic feet of material. So when you're doing lithium mining and refining, uh, you're going through a lot of dirt, a lot of rock, and it, it, it's, it's, uh, it does use a lot of resources to uh, purify and, and get that out. So there's a, a lot of um, research starting out in reusing and reclaiming lithium and other materials from storage batteries. One of the companies that we're very excited about, um, I was talking to them a couple of days ago, um, they're a company that their business model is working with electric vehicle uh, manufacturers and dealers, and what they're doing, they're working mostly like uh, Nissan Leaf uh, batteries. The Nissan Leaf is one of the most popular electric vehicles. And they're repurposing individual cells out of the Nissan Leaf vehicles. And so what their business model is, is providing home and business storage systems using repurposed cells out of either wrecked or vehicles that are having their batteries replaced. Because, you know, it's important for a vehicle to have a, a very high efficiency battery to get a lot of miles out. Weight is important. Well, a big storage battery vault sitting in somebody's garage or sitting in some warehouse someplace, you know, nobody really cares if it weighs a huge amount. Um, all we want to make sure of is that we get the same amount of energy out of it as we put in. And even though a battery might have lower capacity, being a somewhat used battery, um, they still have the same charge discharge efficiency curve. Does that make sense? So that's basically what I can share with you on the on a lithium thing. And and do you happen to know how uh, some of these lithium mines in the desert, say Nevada or Nevada or New Mexico, interface with the Native American? Because I know some of the land, from what I understand, is uh, that they're trying to put mines into some sacred sites. And do you know anything about that? I do not, unfortunately. I I don't know the individual mines and in specifics there. I can just bet though, that if there's uh, a lithium mining operation going on, um, there's a fair amount of workers that are needed for that. So I suspect there'd be some employment for some local people. Could I, could I, uh, let me just follow up on that. If you look at Wired Magazine, maybe three months ago, they have a really good article on the lithium. So you're saying in the solar panels itself, you really don't have the lithium like you do in the storage batteries. Is that correct? That's correct. So does the solar panels have any lithium? Um, there might be some traces in there for some purpose. I don't think there's any to speak of. It's it's a silicon based product. It's a sand, you know. Okay, so it's for ba it's for batteries. Batteries, vehicles. Okay, and that's what I thought. Okay, yeah. thank you. Any We're starting to also see. Um, recycling efforts for solar panels themselves. Um, after a solar panel gets to be 25 or 30 years, uh, we're wanting to figure out what the heck do we do with these things. And um, uh, we very seldom, in fact, I can only remember twice where we've actually 
replace solar panels with new ones, um, but that they will come. And so there's um, work being done right now to uh, get the technology together to be able to recycle these solar panels. That's great. Hi, I, I'm Neil. I'm Neil's husband. And I've, Hi, got, I've got a question about uh, what's the status, if you know, about flexible panels that can be molded to different uh, contours? Um, there are flexible panels out there available. Um, you see a lot of them on um, trailer houses and uh, uh, RVs and camping trailers. Um, in fact, sun power panels, uh, sun power was making some flexible panels in a 100 watt size for the longest time. Mm -hmm. um, you still see those out there available. They're, they're flexible in one dimension. You can make a curve. You can't make a sphere. Okay. Oh, how do they work when it's cloudy? Solar panels are very linear in their output. Um, get half the sun, you get half the electricity. Um, what you find on an overcast day, uh, it's kind of cold and dreary, you might be getting a quarter or a third of the energy you get on a sunny day. Um, when it's a clear day and you've got the light energy coming from a single point in the sky, um, there's a lot of energy available. And on an overcast day where the light is diffused by cloud cover, uh, less energy is available. But what is interesting is that when you're no longer able to see shadows from trees, that means there's no shading from trees either. And so um, what happens is say during the time of day where the sun would normally go behind a bank of trees and your solar would shut way, way down, um, on an overcast day, it will continue operating past that because you're getting light refracted off of overhead clouds. Oh, that's interesting. And the reason we know that is because on all of our systems nowadays, we include um, monitoring. So it ties into your home Wi-Fi and you can actually whip out your iPhone or your your laptop or whatever and look at your monitoring on a real-time basis and see what you're producing on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis. Yeah, I have a friend who, who does that. So. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. So I have another question. It's, it's um, how uh, solar panels react to heat. A friend of mine. Uh, he talked about that already. Oh, he did? Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't here when that happened. Never mind. <laughs> I can give you a quick summary. Um, the solar panels, the the higher the temperature, the lower the efficiency. That's right. There. So, so there's a sweet spot between lots of sun, but not a lot of heat. Yes. And that actually happens on a summer day in the state of Washington because we have these nice sunny days and it might only get up to you know, 75, 80 degrees. Um, the solar panels are working very, very efficiently in that temperature range. So um, Montana, North Dakota, when it's 20 degrees, but totally sunny, things are good. Perfectly good, yes, yeah. huh. great. Um, you can see the solar panels behind me, they're raised up off the roof a little ways. And you do that to allow the roofing to dry out it also allows the solar panels to get a little air circulation and the, uh, uh, the solar panels, the, the glass part of the panels gets a little cooler and can operate more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Seems like the metal roofs would also allow more air circulation because of their, mm. is that true or maybe um, not? Yeah, it's about the same. Uh, yeah. Another interesting feature we found about the solar, and I, I really didn't think this would be a big factor, but people are telling me that it is significant. When we put solar panels on a south-facing roof or a west-facing roof, um, and you have one of those rare hot days in August, they actually cool the attic, they cool the structure, um, mm -hmm. just like a big shade umbrella over the top of the house. And uh, mm -hmm. I didn't realize what a factor that would be. Do you have to clean the solar panels like every year as a routine maintenance item at all? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of windblown debris and stuff. Do you have to, you know, wash them off or clean them off? <laughs> well, the um, 
the, the rainfall we get around here does a really good job of cleaning panels. Um, what doesn't get cleaned off very well is the pollen. Pollen tends to stick to everything. And so I clean my panels um, about once every three years. I do um, the skylights and the gutters on the house and the solar panels um, about, about every three years. You can do it more often. Some people do. Uh, some people have never clean their panels. Um, when I calculate the power output of a system, um, I put in what's called a soiling factor. I make the assumption that nobody ever cleans their panels and that uh, that way, uh, if, if they do clean their panels every once in a while, then the uh, power output is even greater than before. Uh, there are actually outfits around now that uh, do roof cleaning and solar panel cleaning and then skylights and all that stuff. So uh, now I'm to the point where I don't have to get on a roof anymore. Well, that's good. Then you don't have to clean them every year at least. That's good every three years, unless yeah, you're underneath a bunch years. of trees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you, like I said, some people never clean their panels, so they just don't work. How do you clean your panels? What does that mean? Um, what, what you do is you get one of those long handled car washing brushes, like you use to clean a boat or a motorhome or something, and um, hook it up to a garden hose. I use one of those curly Q garden hoses, uh, the nice and lightweight, and just turn on the water and start scrubbing the panels. I work from the top and work downwards. If a person doesn't mind getting on the roof, it's really convenient to stand up near the ridge and work downwards. That way your feet don't get wet. Um, I've actually cleaned mine during a rainstorm. That way I don't have to use a garden hose at all. And, um, <laughs> it's basically a fair amount of water and some elbow grease. Occasionally a little bit of uh, dishwashing soap, liquid dishwashing soap is helpful if you had a lot of pollen, haven't cleaned them for a long time. Um, usually I just use water and elbow grease and one of those soft bristle brushes. I take it that you don't want to use a power washer? That's generally um, bad form to use a pressure washer on a roof or on electrical equipment in general. Okay. Um, it's kind of frowned on. We're a little concerned about safety, obviously. We're a little concerned about driving moisture up underneath the lip of the solar panel frame. Um, we wouldn't want to damage the panel. The glass on the surface has also got a anti-reflective coating. Um, it's to increase the amount of light that goes into the panel compared to what's bouncing off the panel. And so we're a little concerned about a pressure washer over the years of constant use um, messing up that layer. That's why you use a soft bristle brush, not a real coarse one. I would just like... Sorry? I had a question if he wasn't, if John wasn't going to go. Go ahead. Yeah, the, uh, so what kind of penetrations then do you put through your composition roof when you put on the solar panels? It's, I mean, how do you, do you have to seal it, seal the, the, the uh, fasteners so the water doesn't get in or what yeah, do you do? We actually, we actually triple seal that. Um, it's a very, very important part of the installation. I don't have a slide on it, but I do in my, presentation book if we ever meet up. Um, basically, it's a, um, a round uh, metal shoe uh, about two and a half inches in diameter that we, um, we find the center of the top cord of the truss, the rafter, or whatever it is. Um, we mark that, then we pre-drill that minimum two and a half inches and fill that full of a roof mastic uh, blackjack or a mastic material. Then we take this round mounting shoe, place it over the wet mastic and drive a um, stainless steel lag screw down into that. And that's forcing the mastic into any voids that are inside that, uh, that pre-drill hole. Then we take a flashing, a sheet metal flashing, and slide it up under the shingle that's above that um, so that it protects that mounting shoe that's already sealed to the roof. That flashing has a, a preformed um, indentation for that uh, mounting shoe that we've just bolted there and a hole for a threaded boss to come up. Then there's a uh, EPDM rubber washer uh, that uh, goes in between the flashing and that mounting screw, the mounting shoe, 
and a uh, L angle gets bolted to the top of that. Once again, stainless steel fasteners. And after the L angle gets bolted to it, then a, a mounting rail, which provides electrical grounding and a sturdy support structure um, gets attached to that. And about every four to six feet uh, laterally across the road, we'll be mounting one of those mounts. A typical installation might have 20 or 40 of these mounts. So each one of them um, is very, very important to us. We take a lot of care of putting those in. Uh, they're actually manufactured by a company down in Vancouver. Um, we don't just make them up off the top of our head. They're, they're engineered for this purpose. And we've actually never had a roof leak with these things. They're very important to the whole operation. Well, that's great you use stainless steel because they certainly provide a good thermal break. Yeah, corrosion is an issue. Uh, we do a lot of projects for people that live pretty close to the ocean. And um, so we understand the value of stainless steel. And if, if you buy stainless steel fasteners in the quantities that we do, um, you yeah, know, it's not that big of an expense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question and if I can just uh, in at, at this point, uh, I'm obviously not Barbara Hager. Uh, I'll be back in on my wife's <laughs> account. <laughs> but uh, two questions. The first is that individual photovoltaic cells, um, if shaded, um, basically that, that cuts down the current that they will pass. And the individual cells are in series in a, a normal size panel. And uh, in some cases, I believe one can bypass each individual cell with a diode to uh, defeat this the potential problem of shutting down the whole string of cells if one gets uh, shaded so that panels can be made which will be more shade tolerant. Um, is, is there any truth to that? <laughs> well, um, we use bypass diodes in each string of cells in a panel. A typical panel will have six individual strings of cells with either two or three bypass diodes. Um, and the purpose for those is not to let the power um, jump around one of the cells. The purpose for that is to provide a relief for energy uh, to go around the cells that are being shaded. If you don't provide that, then there can actually be too much current going through these shaded cells from the adjacent cells and actually uh, could have burn spots if we didn't have the diodes in there. Now, the um, the sun power cells are built to a different standard, and they have uh, the functionality of having an individual bypass diode on each one of the cells. It's not a discrete component. It's just the way the cells are manufactured. Um, so the sun power panels don't have the bypass diodes at all. They don't need them. Another thing that's happened with uh, uh, individual panels is I, I mentioned the power inverters earlier. Um, it used to be where you had 10 or 12 panels all in electrically in series to provide high voltage for a power inverter. And that let the inverter operate very efficiently at high voltage. Well, now with the advent of microelectronics and much higher reliability electronics, it's much easier to build smaller inverters and SunPower actually has factory installed microinverters on each one of the panels. In fact, we call them ACPV for AC photovoltaic panels. Each one of those panels from SunPower is putting out 240 volts AC. So it completely sidesteps the efficiency issue of one panel and a string of 12 getting shaded well, nowadays, only that one panel is dropped off in power. All the rest of them are still putting out full power energy. The um, sun power microinverters uh, come factory installed, so they benefit by the 25-year warranty that the panels themselves have. That's fascinating. They must be somehow talking to one another to keep them all in phase. Well, each power inverter, no matter what type it is, by definition, has to stay at 60 cycles phased with all the other ones that are out there. If they weren't like that, then they would take down the utility grid. <laughs> yeah. 
So they, they all do that automatically. And um, the neat thing about having all these microinverters uh, on a sun power system is that if we ever want to look at it, we can remotely go into the, the maintenance level of the monitoring uh, through the customer's Wi-Fi and look at the uh, power output of the solar energy system for warranty purposes. Um, and if we're, uh, we've got a system that's producing a little bit less power, we can actually look at each one of the panels on a sunny day and see which one has lowered power output. Might be a bad inverter or a loose connection. Um, and we can actually tell, oh, it's the second one down on the third row, there it is. So a, a warranty service call is made, free of charge and customer, and um, takes care of that problem very quickly. So you can get, so you can get interference on your Wi-Fi system sometimes with the uh, solar panels? No, it um, uses such a small bandwidth um, that it doesn't really affect the Wi-Fi. Um, we do sometimes get service call requests when a customer changes out his router and he forgets what the uh, IP address is, but um, that's the only issue we ever run into. <laughs> Okay. I have uh, another question uh, dealing with hot water. Uh, so mm -hmm. not, not photovoltaic in this case, but have you or do you install any sort of um, hot water heating uh, water boost before it goes into the house um, um, hot water tank? Yes, I've been doing solar for over 30 years and that's a lot of the systems I've put in over the years. I have two solar hot water systems on my house here in Paulsville. Um, we don't do very many of them anymore. Um, and the reason for that is nowadays, it's more efficient to slightly oversize your solar electric system, use the space that the solar water heater would have occupied, and then use a hybrid heat pump water heater with your solar generated electricity to provide the hot water for the household. Um, you also get better tax incentives um, with solar electric. Um, even though thermally, if you look at only the thermodynamic effect, it's much more efficient to heat water directly with photons. Um, with doing it with a solar energy system, there's no moving parts involved in the solar part of it. So the reliability is higher and the incentives are greater. Thank you. Well, that's really interesting. Um, the hybrid water heater, is that similar to a heat pump? Yeah, that's the new name they're calling a heat pump water heater. In fact, um, PSE has a discount program going on right now. Um, you can buy one and get an instant $500 rebate. I think they're a good deal. Um, I put one in for my dad, oh, years ago, um, and we put it in the garage. Well, his tool bench was in the garage too. And what those things tend to do is remove moisture from the air as well as the latent heat. And so he no longer had any issues with tools rusting in the wet garage. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I like mine because I park my pickup in the garage while I come home in the afternoon and uh, pull this warm pickup in there. And so I've got my uh, hybrid water heater set up on a timer. So it comes on at about five o'clock in the afternoon and cools down the garage. So would you tell me again what that uh, special is that's going on now you were talking about? Well, there's two specials actually I'll mention. Um, one is PSE has an instant rebate program going on for hybrid water heaters. They have to meet a certain criteria, of course. Um, and they're available at uh, like Home Depot and Lowe's and various plumbers and stuff. You can get these hybrid water heaters. It's a typically a 66 or an 80 gallon tank, and it's got a compressor unit built on the top of the tank. So they're a little bit taller. Um, they want to go, the best place to put them is in a garage, and um, they are more expensive than a regular tank type water heater, but they extract the thermal energy from the surrounding air and put it into the water. So it acts like it's kind of giving you the benefit of a heat mm -hmm. pump for heating your house compared to electric resistance heating for a house. The other um, special that's going on right now 
is uh, SunPower has a $750 rebate for people installing solar, signing up to get a, a solar energy system that will be installed in the first quarter of 2023. Um, so after the system gets installed, they got a check in the mail for 750 bucks. Is after the first quarter? Yes. Which is convenient because we're installing scheduling uh, uh, into January right now anyway. The first quarter of 2023. That's correct. Yes. Oh, okay. Just a second. Well, why don't you just blurt it out? Because it looks like. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. This is Neil again back here. Um, yes. Do you work with many homes that are passive solar systems as well? Um, I guess you got to define what a passive solar energy home is a south facing window and thermal mass and that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, a lot of thermal mass, south facing windows, lots of insulation. The idea being to minimize all heat costs and things of that sort. Sure. Um, we, we call those net zero homes nowadays. Um, the, the idea of a big salt box looking home with uh, all glass windows on the south and the square shop look of the 70s, that's kind of gone away a little bit. Now with um, high efficiency insulation and better quality windows, you can have kind of a normal looking house with a view aim in the direction you want to have it aim um, and, and have a, a net zero home. Um, a big factor of that, of course, is providing all or most of your electricity with your um, uh, on the property solar energy system. Right. Yeah. So we get well, quite I, a I can do the cross laminated timber one. I actually interviewed uh, the CEO of the firm that went bankrupt, so I've been following it to an extent. Okay. Okay. More questions? Don't misunderstand me. I'm not going to say, hey, cross laminated timber companies are going bankrupt. I mean, I'm just making that. John, fact. I've got some background. That's, that's John, all that was about. Could you beat yourself, John? Huh? This one, I had a, I had a question. Um, is it yes. the micro inverters? Are they, uh, do they tend to be about the same price as a uh, larger system that has maybe uh, two inverters, two large inverters? Well, it's interesting. It used to be where micro inverter systems were indeed more expensive than having a single string inverter or two string inverters. Um, now, however, because they're making a lot more microinverters, um, the, the cost has gone down. The, the, the electronics involved in these things has gotten very, very reliable and miniaturized. Um, they're all potted. It's all a, a sealed metal unit mounted to the back of the panel. Um, and it's, uh, it's all sealed, potted. So uh, reliability is, is quite good. Um, in fact, I like to talk about the concept of single point of failure. On older systems, you had a single inverter and the inverter is fairly complicated. And if that uh, failed, then your entire system is down until a replacement inverter gets installed. Well, these micro inverters, um, we commonly will have one or two extra inverters sitting on the truck. I've got three or four inverters sitting on my tool bench at home. Um, the uh, it, it's real straightforward to replace one. And if one went out in a 30 panel system, you've lost one 30th of your system. Um, all the rest of it's still working just fine. So there's no longer any single point of failure in these solar energy systems. And the overall reliability factor has gone way, way up. Well, you've talked about a lot of question, your pros. Yeah, uh, uh, just structurally, do we give Kilmer any heads up at all about what we're going to ask about? Because uh, I can see both ways are valid, but it might be more helpful if he, like, you know, this, is, Kimber, this isn't instance, working, Marty. He, this he might be able to answer better if he knows where we're coming from. Yeah. I don't understand the question. Uh, Greg, he's in a different meeting. And oh, no. <laughs> He doesn't realize that we can hear him. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Anybody well, have his phone number to just call him, tell him? I'll try. 
So I, what are the cons? I've heard all the good, the pros. What would you say are the cons besides the money? Um, some people have a roof that is uh, two or three years old and they're not ready to replace it yet. But I don't want you know, solar panels on a roof that's going to be replaced in, in five years and I've got to take the panels off. Uh, so if you've got a, a, a house that has a, a roof that's um, 20 years old and it might be ready to replace in 25 years, then I'm going to be really hesitant to put solar panels on that roof. So that's a drawback. Um, some people, if uh, they've got a really beautiful front facade of their house and it faces south, might be kind of hesitant to put solar panels on the front of their house. Um, and I can understand that. Um, we do offer those sun power panels in an all black variety, which minimizes the uh, uh, aesthetic issue and complaints. Um, but still, that's, that's a, a drawback, if you want to call it that. Uh, another big drawback, I suppose, is that there's not enough capacity right now to build and ship and install <laughs> all the solar panels we need to to solve some of our energy issues. Um, we, you know, if everybody on my block wanted solar panels, uh, it, it'd take a while. There's only two houses on my block that have panels. Um, and if everybody in the whole county, the whole state wanted solar panels on all the good south facing roofs that are out there, we just couldn't satisfy that need. We, we just don't have the capacity to install that many solar panels. Um, bottom line is um, anybody that's interested and has a decent roof ought to be looking to get them installed sooner than later before yeah. you know, that happens. Have you installed uh, for communities, solar panels for entire communities, even a small community? Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, we have been working with Habitat for Humanity. We do the um, Habitat houses. They yeah. have houses. Uh, there's a place called Harris Court that's behind the Walmart building in um, Port Orchard. And um, I think they're up to 30 houses now. And um, They've all got solar okay. panels on them. Um, so Jonah would know about that. I'm sorry? I need to mute myself, sorry. That's okay. Um, the, uh, uh, it's just a, uh, an organization that does uh, home building for uh, uh, medium and low income people. And, and it makes a lot of sense to put solar on those houses as they're being built. Um, we've uh, done work with various contractors and such. Um, uh, most of our work, though, is with Joe Average homeowner and people that are just regular old people that want to, to do something about solar energy in this area. So how much normally average does it cost to put in the additional electrical wherewithal that you have to put in to accommodate solar? Um, we do all the electrical work required. We're licensed and bonded electricians. Um, and so we take care of it. It's usually either just an additional breaker in the breaker panel. Oh, if the okay. breaker panel's all full up, then sometimes we'll put it in a sub panel. Mm -hmm. If it's over a certain size, say you end up with um, you know, 30 panels uh, to match the electrical usage, um, then we, that's too big to just put a breaker in the panel. So we do what's called a line side tap. We actually connect into the uh, incoming uh, cables to the breaker panel. Um, so we do that all internally. It, it's all included in the quote. Um, we pull the permits. We do the application for the utility net metering. Um, we do all these things as a, uh, as a, a service to make it all one uh, fixed number. There's no hidden permit fees or any other surprises. Um, the reason we do that is we want to give you one number so you easily mm -hmm. do your tax credit. Good. Thank you. I had a question on, um, this isn't a political question, I'm just wondering, so why is it that, you know, China seems to make the majority of the global solar panels, I gather, is it because labor's cheaper, the government pays for some of it? Do you 
Is it just because this, the labor's too much here in the country and people don't want to pay it? Is that the issue? What is the issue? Well, China has a way of building anything a whole lot cheaper than what we can. And um, one of the problems is that they're using slave labor or very, very, very low paid labor to assemble these sorts of things. Um, you know, China's government recognizes that uh, burning coal is not going to be a good long term solution. Um, there's huge, huge problems with air pollution in China. Well, so they are producing a lot of solar panels for self consumption. And of course, they love to export things to other countries and bring in coal solar hard dollars. So um, in Australia, you, you see most of the solar being installed in Australia is Chinese made panels. Um, a lot of the panels installed in Europe are made in Europe, uh, some made in the US. Uh, in the US, especially on the West Coast, um, there's more uh, uh, use of US manufactured uh, products. Um, there's a company making panels in Georgia. It's actually owned by the um, uh, South Koreans. And uh, that company is a huge, huge manufacturer of solar panels uh, for use in the Southeast. Um, the company I, I mentioned earlier, Silfab, um, they're a Canadian company that manufactures in the state of Washington. Um, they probably have a fair number of components in their panels that are made in other countries, China perhaps. A lot of the glass used in solar panels is made in China. Um, so it's tough to get around this global manufacturing thing that we have. Uh, do you have company, any idea? Yeah. Do you, have, do you have any idea of, you know, percentage wise, how much more it would cost, you know, to manufacture in the US, pay the premium so we don't have to buy from China? Do you have any idea at all? <laughs> I don't because we don't sell any Chinese solar panels. So I don't have a good feel for what that is. If I had to guess, I'd say um, the same power solar panel from China versus from Washington might be 30% less. I don't know. That's a lousy guess. Oh. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I'd yeah, like we try know. really hard to source as many materials as we possibly can um, locally and sustainably. That's great. Very good. So would do what we can do. Would we expect that the same um, the same application uh, that was here, if it were in um, uh, Arizona, would produce about, what, uh, maybe 30% uh, more? That sounds like a reasonable number. So does it, it seems to me like, wouldn't it be uh, behoove the country to put more uh, what emphasis in those countries that have the highest potential for producing it? Um, I guess I'd, I'd just say it, you know, uh, that the highest potential places should be exploited first. Well, that would be important if it didn't cost anything to transfer power uh, to other areas. Um, Right now, uh, they say that one ninth of all the electricity produced is lost in transmission. So there's a big benefit in uh, distributed energy sources. And solar panels happen to be one of the primary examples of distributed energy. Um, we would love to see more solar being installed in the Southwest and in Washington and all sorts of other places. Um, what uh, you, you see a lot of political fighting about uh, implementation of solar. Um, any place where there's a large amount of coal production um, tends to be kind of uh, the old fashioned methodology and one huge gigantic utility controlling the whole state. You know, that's what you see in Nevada um, to a lesser extent in uh, Kentucky and uh, uh, Montana. Um, in Washington, we've got quite a few different utilities and quite a few different energy sources, hydroelectric, you know, coal-fired plants, uh, wind turbines, a bunch of different things. And so in Washington, um, 
we can install solar as much as we can possibly get on people's roofs and not really affect the, the balance of the utilities revenue scheme. Um, PSE is one of the larger utilities in the state of Washington. And um, they've been very accepting of uh, electricity being put onto the grid. Other utilities are not quite so nice. <laughs> you know, when when uh, people are talking about getting solar and they're, you know, I talk about, yeah, you're, you're sending electricity to the grid and then they give it back to you and they don't make any profit on what they're storing for you, essentially. Um, I remind people, don't, don't feel too bad for the utility because they're taking that energy that you've sent them and what are they doing with it? They're either reducing the amount of uh, water that goes through the turbine or they are selling it to some business someplace. Um, they're, they're, there's some advantages to the utility for having that electricity. But don't feel bad about you know, selling power to the grid and then them giving it back to you at no profit. Yeah. What about these big server farms? You know, I mean, I don't think people realize how much electrical energy these server farms take, the so-called cloud. That's a hell of a lot of energy they take. Yeah. And uh, of course, we want to add electric cars to it, too. And I don't even, I don't even know if our grid system's ready for that. But I mean, are, have you, are you aware of people of some of the tech companies installing solar for their, there's these huge server farms? throughout the country? Well, they're installing solar and they're installing server farms. So they're not usually putting solar panels right on top of those buildings. Um, when a lot of these companies build a server farm, they're really concerned about security, water levels, um, stability. You wanna make sure that nothing's gonna bother that. So they don't really wanna put a super high visibility solar array right there at their building facility. So you typically see large companies that have these solar farms, um, you know, they'll be off the beaten path uh, out a little ways. And so they're not a big attractant to uh, vandals or worse. Yeah, no, I, I, I've been in one in Brooklyn. It looked like an old dump warehouse in Brooklyn. I went inside and my God, it was just, <laughs> wow. Very secure, very high tech, tremendous energy to cool it. I yep. was shocked because it just looked like a dump on the outside. They even had graffiti on the walls, the exterior walls. <laughs> yeah, stealth. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're building those things in areas that typically have uh, low uh, electrical rates. Um, Oregon and Eastern Washington, uh, we're seeing some of those things going in. But they don't talk about them a lot. Yeah, no, it makes sense what you're saying about the visibility. That makes total sense. Yeah. Is there a next generation of solar uh, solar cells that uh, are more resistant to the extreme heat that we're going to be seeing in the Southwest and all over the world? Do you see um, that? Solar cells are fairly well evolved right now. We're, we're getting pretty close to the theoretical maximum efficiency on cells. It was actually calculated by Albert Einstein. Um, he won the first uh, uh, Nobel Prize for his work in photovoltaics. He's the one that coined the term photovoltaics. Um, so there's little tiny bits of improvement and efficiency and temperature tolerance on solar cells. What uh, is, is the big push is to be able to manufacture them in larger quantities and uh, at lower cost. So you're seeing, uh, especially Chinese uh, panels where they're making them with cheaper components. Um, we're gonna start seeing uh, plastic glazing versus tempered glass. We're gonna start seeing um, fiberglass frames versus metal frames. Uh, we're gonna just see a general uh, goal to make things that won't last as long as what we've got now because it's a world of um, you know obsolescence. So I think we're installing panels that are going to be lasting you know 30, 40, 50 years, and panels that are going to be installed in 10 years from now. Um, that's going to be the typical lifespan of 
10, 15 years. I, I think that we're going to see lower cost, uh, lower quality um, panels in the future, just like a lot of other things we see in life nowadays. Let me uh, bail in, if I may, um, with a minutia question on microinverters. You see, uh -huh. Sun Power has those built in to each panel. Um, are those available sort of in that size to accompany each panel coming from Sil Power or Silfab? Yeah, Silfab will use a, a company called Enphase, which is the largest uh, microinverter manufacturer around. They have uh, four or five different series of um, sizes of microinverters for each one of the panels. And so when we install a Silfab system, it'll have one uh, end phase microinverter uh, installed. Actually, it's installed on the framework that's below the solar panels and then wired to it. An interesting little tidbit though, um, SunPower owns 25% of end phase. <laughs> So uh, it's actually an end phase manufactured inverter that's on the sun, sun power panel. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Greg, you know everything. That's wonderful. And we sure appreciate you coming to talk with us. Uh, does anyone else have another question? Or I think we used up everybody's uh, time pretty much tonight, but uh, this has been really interesting and valuable, and um, we'll look forward to putting this to work. Thanks so well, good, much. Good, good. I work really hard on getting solar panels wherever I can get them, so thank That's you very great. much for your interest. I appreciate your time. Yeah. Okay, good night, everybody, and thanks for coming. Mm -hmm.